Welcome back. Today we will introduce the theory of nonlinear elasticity that we will need for soft tissues. We know that soft tissues are not elastic. Stress depends on strain, but also on the history of strain. However, the hysteresis loop is only weakly dependent on strain rate, and it may be reasonable to assume that tissues in vivo are already preconditioned. Therefore, Fung theorized that elasticity may be suitable for soft tissues with the proviso that we may have to use a different stress-strain curve for the loading and unloading portions. This is known as the pseudo-elasticity concept. This concept is really a justification for using elasticity theory for soft tissues. Unlike in bone, linear elasticity is inappropriate for soft tissues. We need nonlinear, finite elasticity. So there are two ways of defining elasticity. The first way is that in elastic material, the stress depends only on the strain. The alternative is that in a hyperelastic material, the work dW done by the stress to cause the strain is stored as potential energy in a thermodynamically reversible process. Mathematically, the first definition here is simply T equals T of epsilon here, the Cauchy strain being used, or Tij equals Tij epsilon KL. The second definition for hyperelasticity says that dW equals T d epsilon, or integrating this, that the stress T equals del W del epsilon, or in components, Tij equals del W del epsilon Ij, where W here is a work per unit volume it is known as the strain energy density. For example, for a Hookean elastic material, Tij equals Cijkl, epsilon Kl for the most general case. Equivalently, we could write that the strain energy W is one half Cijkl, epsilon Ij, epsilon Kl. This is a quadratic function that, when differentiated, gives us Tij equals Cijkl epsilon KL. So these two formulations are equivalent, but it turns out that hyperelasticity is a little more restrictive than elasticity, and this is very valuable when we start to study nonlinear elasticity. So the first advantage of hyperelasticity is that when a material is nonlinear, whereas any nonlinear relation may be possible for the definition of elasticity, the hyperelasticity that relation must be able to be integrated to give us a strain energy. Furthermore, since strain energy is a physical quantity, it's constrained by the laws of thermodynamics, particularly the first and second laws of thermodynamics. And so hyperelasticity gives us a way of constraining the possible stress-strain relations to those that are thermodynamically permissible. A second advantage of hyperelasticity is that we can use the first law of thermodynamics to gain some insight into the molecular basis of the elasticity of different materials. And so we can potentially use thermodynamic principles to help derive strain energy functions for particular materials. A final benefit of the hyperelastic formulation is that energy is a scalar. Therefore, to write the stress strain relation for a nonlinear material, we only need to write one nonlinear strain energy function rather than six nonlinear stress strain relations. So now to go further, we need to derive the conservation of energy for a continuum. Conservation of energy for a continuum states that the rate of change of internal energy is equal to the rate of work done by the stresses plus the rate of heat absorbed. We'll use this definition to derive the conservation of energy in a continuum. And then when we're finished, we'll come back and use it to gain some insights into the molecular underpinnings of the strain energy. Today, we're going to derive the equation for conservation of energy in a continuum. So starting by considering the different terms that contribute to the energy, let's first write down an expression for the kinetic energy of a material that instantaneously occupies a region R in a continuum. So the kinetic energy K is one half of the volume integral over the region R of rho times V dot V with respect to volume, or an in index notation, one half rho vi vi dv. So energy is a scalar quantity, and it's one half mv squared. The internal energy, i, 
is the volume integral over r of rho times e with respect to volume, where e is defined as the internal energy density, in other words, the internal energy per unit mass. We'll discuss later what the internal energy could be. Now, from the first law of thermodynamics, we can state conservation of energy as the rate of change of the kinetic plus internal energy of the body or of the region is equal to the rate at which work is done by the body and surface forces, and we'll call that W dot, plus the rate of heat absorption into R across its boundary S, and we'll call that Q dot. So the rate of work done by the body forces is equal to the volume integral over R of rho times B dot V with respect to volume. So if force times displacement is work, then force times velocity is rate of work. The rate of work done by the surface forces is similarly the surface integral of Tn dot V with respect to S, or using Cauchy's formula, Nt, where T is a stress, dot V dS. Finally, the rate of heat entering the region R across the boundary S equals negative of the surface integral of Q dot N dS, where Q is the heat flux vector, N is the outward normal to the surface, and therefore Q dot N is the outward heat flux, therefore negative of the surface integral of Q dot N is the total rate of heat entering. So putting all of these terms together, uh, our statement of conservation of energy becomes the material derivative of the volume integral over R of rho times one half V dot V plus E, the internal energy density integrated with respect to volume is equal to the volume integral over R of rho times B dot V the rate of work done by the body forces plus the surface integral of n dotted with t dot v, so that's the work done by the surface forces minus q, uh, the uh, energy due to the heat flux. Or in index notation, the material derivative of the volume integral of rho times one half vi vi plus e dv is equal to the volume integral over r of rho vi vi dv plus the surface integral over s of tji vi minus qj times nj integrated with respect to s. So now again using the divergence theorem to turn this surface integral into a volume integral, we obtain that the volume integral over R of rho times the material time derivative of one half vi vi plus e is equal to the volume integral over R of rho times bi vi plus del del xj of tji vi minus qj integrated with respect to volume. And now again, since the region R is arbitrary and the equations must hold for any and all regions R, then the integrands themselves must be satisfied. 
and therefore rho of material derivative times one half bi bi plus e equals rho times bi bi plus del del xj tji bi minus qj. Now recognizing that the material derivative of the velocity of dbi dt is ai, the acceleration, we can rearrange the equation above to obtain the following. vi times rho times ai, which is ddt of vi, minus rho times bi here, minus rho minus del tji del xi, plus rho times de dt, term, minus tji times del vi del xj, plus del qj del xj. Then we recognize that this term inside the brackets is actually zero from conservation of linear momentum. This is the conservation of linear momentum says that rho times ai equals rho bi plus del tji del xi. So this term is zero thanks to conservation of linear momentum. And so therefore our conservation of energy equation simplifies to rho times dE dt equals the stress tji del vi del xj minus del qi del xi. Now tji del vi del xj, this term here, could also be written as one half tij del vi del xj plus del vj del xi. And that's because we know that the stress tensor is symmetric. And one half del vi del xj plus del vj del xi is dij, the rate of deformation tensor. Therefore, we can also write our conservation of energy equation as rho times the material derivative of the internal energy with respect to time is equal to tij dij minus del qi del xi, or in direct notation, rho de dt equals the trace of t dot d, this is the stress times the rate of deformation, minus the divergence of q, the heat flux vector, where the heat flux vector comes from Fourier's law of heat conduction, which states that Q, the heat flux, is equal to minus K times the gradient of the temperature, shown here as T, so T is the absolute temperature, and K is the thermal conductivity. So this is the conservation of energy for a continuum. It includes three terms, the internal energy, the rate of work done by the stresses, which derived from the work done by the body and surface forces and was simplified by application of conservation of linear momentum, and then the rate of heat entering the system. So all that leaves is the question, well, what is the internal energy I or the internal energy density E? And really, this is a property of the material. What this statement is really saying is that as the material undergoes stress and deformation, and as heat enters or leaves it, the, the net energy of the material changes. And that net energy must be somehow stored internally in the material. And we'll learn later that different types of material store their internal energy differently. For example, crystalline solid materials like metals, for example, tend to store their internal energy as the energy between uh, the bonds of the crystals. Whereas rubbery type of materials like rubber actually store their internal energy as entropic energy. And so 
applying stresses to a crystalline type of material increases the internal energy between the bonds of the material, whereas applying stresses to a rubbery material actually increases the internal energy by decreasing the entropy of the system by making the disordered tangled uh, fibers are less disordered and therefore having uh, less entropy. So now we can use the conservation of energy for continuum to interpret the underlying meaning of the strain energy in a reversible deformation of an elastic material. Recall that the conservation of energy states that the rate of change of internal energy equals the rate of work done by the stresses plus the rate of heat absorbed. So we can write this as rho di dt equals dwt plus rho dq dt. For a thermodynamically reversible process, the change in total entropy ds is equal to dq over theta, where theta is the temperature. So we can therefore write from the conservation of energy that dw equals rho times di minus dq, which is therefore equal to rho times di minus theta ds which is Tij d epsilon aj, the work done by the stresses. So given that the stress is the derivative of the strain energy with respect to the strain, we can now see that the stress arises from an increase in internal energy or a decrease in entropy S with strain. So in other words, the strain energy can be stored as an increase in internal energy or a decrease in entropy, or some combination of both. Crystalline organized materials such as collagen derive their stresses from an increase in the internal energy between their bonds. So in other words, the strain energy W is equivalent to rho times the internal energy. However, rubbery materials such as rubber and elastin derive their stresses from a decrease in entropy as the material is deformed. So in these materials, W is equivalent to rho times f, the free energy, where the Helmholtz free energy is equal to i minus theta s. So we'll sometimes hear the constitutive laws referred to in terms of the free energy uh, or the internal energy, because both of these uh, can give rise to strain energy. So we've now been able to use the conservation of energy in a continuum to gain some insight into how real materials uh, store strain energy during an elastic deformation, either as internal energy or as entropy changes. Next time, we'll derive the constitutive equation for a nonlinear elastic material using the strain energy function.